Okay, go ahead, Dan. Most righteous and heavenly Father, we thank you for another day. We thank you for another word. We thank you for all being here, Almighty God. Lord, guard us wherever we are at this present moment. Lord God, open our mind, our ears, our eyes, our spirit to receive what you say. Almighty God, let Lisa speak with the Holy Spirit. Let we hear the voice of God through our teaching today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Taz. One Saturday, I would love to see a few faces join me online. Um, but I understand sometimes we're driving and doing different things. But welcome to BSI again. So glad you're on. And I know others will be joining us. Um, anybody want to share a testimony of the goodness of the Lord? Over the past week, since the time last time we met together. Or if you just want to heal up God, <laughs> you can do that as well. Any testimonies to share? Uh, good day, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, Doug. Um, I just want to big up God um, and, and just tell him thank you for just being faithful. Thank him for giving me a second chance at life. Thank him for just loving on me. You know, sometimes when you you grow a certain way or you think a certain way. Um, it takes God to break down those barriers that would hold you hostage or hold you in, bus, in, in, in bondage. So I'm just telling God thanks for releasing his daughter and setting her free in Jesus' name. <laughs> Amen. 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 Thank you for sharing that, Janelle, setting us all free. Morning, Marianne. Good morning. Morning, glad you're on today. Just asked if anyone had any testimonies. Um, so if you do want to share something, but I just want to give God thanks and, and praise because He's just so wonderful. And I think sometimes it's like, you know, it's always refreshing reading the word, but sometimes you just get a uh, you know, it just washes you and reminds us how much we are loved, you know, at that very moment when you need to be reminded how much we are loved. So I'm just thanking God. For his beautiful word that you know was here before I, I came on this earth will be here afterwards and it will be always available hopefully you know it's a privilege to be able to read it freely you know without um, worry that you know you're going to be persecuted and because we know in some places people are persecuted and don't have freedom you know free access to the word so I'm giving God thanks for it because um it's really a lamp onto my feet that it's really a refresher for my soul. It's really life, you know, for my mind and my soul um, when I need it. So thankful for his word. Anybody else want to share? If a testimony? Okay. All right. As usual, if any, if you want to share something later on, you're more than welcome to. Um, but we're going to go straight into the word, our study today rather and we're actually going to continue in our study of water today um, I'm going to ask a question when you think of the word or when I say the word rather defile you know what are all the things that come to mind when you hear that word defile dirty yeah. contaminate mm -hmm. Ruin. Great words. And any any other any others that come to your mind as you hear the word defile? Rejected. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Anything else? Okay, I see Donna joining us. I'm just gonna give her Second to join. Morning, Donna. Morning. Morning. I'm by mom and I'm okay. cleaning. So okay. I have to move because I'm moving up the furniture. I'm right. doing in the room. Okay. No problem. I'm glad you're on. Morning, Michelle. Morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. So a, a question I just put out is, you know, when I say the word defile what comes to mind? Um, 
just gonna ask before I share what words have been said. Anybody else wanna add anything else? All right, so we have dirty, contaminated, ruined, rejected, all you know, very negative, very negative things. And um, just want to keep that in mind in our study today. Some other words um, that were used to define defile are, you know, made foul, um, well, dirty covers it, but unclean, polluted, tainted, to spoil something or someone so that thing or person is less beautiful or pure. So as we know, God has had a plan for us, you know, from before Adam and Eve even committed the first sin to redeem us, to justify us, to make us holy and acceptable to himself, to present us as blameless, faultless, and, and pure. You know, very, so opposite, right? Blameless, pure, faultless. So very different from the negative association with the word defile. You know, it's a plan that has had multiple parts and progress through the span of mankind. And I know this is very rudimentary, but I've kind of chunked it into three parts, right? The time before Jesus walked the earth, the time while he walked the earth and died on the cross, and the present dispensation, a time of him seated at the right hand of God. You know, God has been teaching mankind the very same things from beginning to now and until the end, but in different ways. Everything God does is about reconciling us to himself. The Bible says, be holy, for he is holy. And the definition of holy is, you know, properly whole or entire or perfect in a moral sense. And again, very different from the imagery of defile. There is a process for holiness and reconciliation. We see it in the journey of the children of Israel out of captivity, the promises he made to them, the ordinances and the laws he gave to Moses to teach the people the sacrifices through the shedding of the blood of animals as payment for their sins. And as we also studied two weeks ago about, you know, ceremonial cleansing to purify the people from their defilement. Even as the priests were handling the meat, you know, which the sins of the people were on, um, the, 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 the um, priests who had been, you know, consecrated because they're handling this meat, they themselves became defiled and had to be purified in the process. There were also other ways, you know, that people became defiled and God used water to purify the people. Hebrews 10, one tells us that the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer, they offer these continually year by year, make those who approach perfect for then would they not have ceased to be offered for the worshipers once purified would have had no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year because they were doing it every year for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away their sins. So water and blood were used to reconcile us to God in the time of the Old Testament, but they were only a shadow of Jesus. And this is why Jesus himself came by water and by blood. First John 1 verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So in the reconciliation process, we were being forgiven and also being cleansed. John 19 verse 34 says, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, his side being Jesus's side when he was on the cross. And immediately blood and water came out. Another scripture in first John chapter five verses six through eight says, this is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the spirit who bears witness because the spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the father, the word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. First John chapter three, verse three says, behold, what manner of love the father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. 
Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not been revealed yet what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him and as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So there are several definitions of purification, but I chose this one. It says purification is defined as creating a habitation for the spirit of God to dwell when we have been washed by the word. So he forgive, forgave us of our sins, but was also preparing us, our bodies, to host the spirit of God. You know, at that time in the Old Testament, it would say, you know, the spirit of the Lord came on the people, but it would not describe the spirit of God being in the people. So again, you know, it's a process that he's leading mankind, you know, from beginning to end to reconcile us to him. So since our bodies are now the living sacrifice and the temple of God, we are purified for God's spirit to dwell in us. But, you know, looking back, like, how did we become defiled? Why did we need to be purified? And we know it's because of our sins. You know, our sins made us unclean. And here are some of the things that the Bible, you know, pointed out specifically about being defiled. You know, if you touched a dead body, you were unclean. If you touched anything, a woman who was on her period touched, you were unclean. Um, specifically about that point, about a woman's menstruation, it says in Leviticus chapter 15, 19 through 23, when a woman has a discharge, if her discharge in her body is blood, she shall continue in her menstrual impurity for seven days. And whoever touches her shall be unclean until evening. Everything also on which she lies during her menstrual impurity shall be unclean, and everything on which she sits shall be unclean. Anyone who touches her bed shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. So anyone who did any of these things, you know, would be defiled because of her uncleanness. And we know when um, in that same time they talked about leprous people being unclean. If you ate certain things, you would be unclean. You know, if you committed adultery, you were unclean. And given any of these things and several others, you were unclean, defiled, and could not come near the tabernacle because God is holy. Numbers 5 verse 2 says, Command the children of Israel that they put out of the camp every leper, everyone who has a discharge, and whoever becomes defiled by a corpse. Numbers 19 verse 20 says, but the man who is unclean does not purify himself. That person, the man who is unclean and does not purify himself, that person shall be cut off from among the assembly because he has defiled the sanctuary of the Lord. The water of purification has not been sprinkled on him. He is unclean. So now, you know, hearing all these things about what caused people to be unclean and unclean is also to be defiled and that they would be cut off from the assembly and that they could not come into the sanctuary of the Lord because they would defile the sanctuary of the Lord. What do you think the, the people, you know, in the examples, the leprous people, um, the one who might have committed adultery, the woman who might have had a discharge and or someone else who sinned in a, another way that had made them unclean. When you think, think about the personal experience of these people, you know, when they're cut off from the assembly um, and they're placed outside the camp. Can you just share with me as an individual, if you were in those shoes, like what are the things that you would be feeling? What are some of the, what are the things that would be going through your mind, going through your heart when you're in that position? Fear of being alone. Okay. Losing my support systems and mm. true. Okay. Anything uh, probably else? probably shame as well. Mm hmm Definitely. Okay. Um, I would also go back to saying feeling rejected. Mm -hmm. Um, in a season when you feel rejected. You can be when and also when you're filled with shame, as the previous sister said, then you can turn to rebelliousness. 
Mm -hmm. um, feeling like you have to rebel, feeling like you have to go where you're wanted. And that may not necessarily be the best place for you. So rebelliousness, feeling unworthy as mm -hmm. if there is nothing that you can do to change um, your situation. Okay, okay. But all the authentic feelings. Um, is there any other, you know, emotion or thought that anyone thinks that um good morning everyone? Uh, morning, Shanika. Um, for me, especially with the woman with the issue of blood, um, I can I would have a sense of like kind of anger. Mm -hmm. Why I said that? Because I I I didn't do anything I, you know i didn't commit adultery i didn't i didn't make myself this that is happening to me i didn't do anything to cause this and i'm being ostracized or i'm being put out everybody you know my, even my family because you'd have to look at it even her family would have to you know put her one side and to, to go through that for so many years i i surmise every morning waking up with that you're praying and you're believing and you're hoping and you're trusting and you know the word didn't give much about her but it said you know, she spent all she had on physicians trying to get help and I guess just day in day out of not getting I, I can sense a sense of like anger and anguish coming mm -hmm. in like why me you know why are you doing this to me so I, I can maybe pick up a bit of despair and anguish from, from her okay okay could um, I add um, also feel, maybe feeling hopelessness because mm. the okay. situation yeah. mm -hmm. right the, the the label has already I I love I love what everyone has shared anyone else want to share anything else okay so we you know we defined the word defiled before and all the you know negative associations with the word defiled and now you know these people have been labeled as unclean and this shame is upon them you know from all the negative associations associations with the word defiled dirty contaminated ruined rejected so the feeling it's not bringing anything anything good you know when now on top of that label you're now put outside fear of being alone you said losing your support system shame um, anger because he didn't do anything in the case of the, the menstruation, anguish, hopelessness, unworthy, feeling, you know, rejected. But, you know, God, he, he ordained it to be so, you know, and um, it may have seemed harsh, but as I said before, you know, everything God does is about reconciling us to himself and we know God is love. So everything God does is out of love. So Leviticus chapter 15, verse 31 said, um, 31, um, this is God speaking to Moses. He says, thus you shall separate the children of Israel from their uncleanness, lest they die in their uncleanness when they defile my tabernacle that is among them. You know, um, I don't know if you remember the scripture where, you know, God, the people are coming close to the mountain of God and God is telling Moses, tell the people not the, not to touch the mountain, not to come near, you know, lest the lest God breaks out against them. So he's talking about himself, you know, but because he has these ordinances, because he had these ways by which people had to approach him, they had to be followed. And if they weren't followed, then the God would break out against against them you know he cannot go against his word and so his word said that he had to be approaching a certain way the people had to be you know um, made clean from their sins the people had to be you know forgiven for their sins through you know sacrifices sacrifices so you know he had a process and again it's all part of his long-range plan right so Shanika brought up the woman with the issue of blood so consider you know, as you hear these things, consider the woman with the issue of blood who had it for 12 years. You know, the woman by the well, I don't know if you remember the Samaritan woman when Jesus's disciples left to go get something and he was just left by the well and this woman was coming to get water. 
And he said to her that, you know, she had five husbands and the one she was with was not her own. So again, this woman is unclean. The woman with the issue of blood for 12 years is unclean. There's also consider the woman caught in the act of adultery who the men wanted to stone, you know, and um, they came to Jesus to talk about what she had done. Consider the woman who had washed Jesus's feet with her tears and dried it with her hair. And she was a harlot, you know, at that time. And also consider the leprous man. I don't know if you remember the scripture where 10 leprous men were healed and only one, you know, turned back. Why do you think God had all these regulations but now we don't practice any of them. You know, did, did God change his mind? You know, why do you think all these things were in place, but they are not, they are no longer required today? I think I said it kind of already, but um, why do you think that? Maybe you have something to add to what I've already said. Any thoughts? One word, Jesus. Amen. <laughs> That's what I was going to say was Jesus. <laughs> Amen. Yes. Amen. Again, all those things were a shadow of the good thing to come. The good thing being Jesus, the good news, right? The one who himself, he fulfilled all that the law required. Amen. You know, God, God was teaching mankind also the concept of, you know, uncleanness and defilement, the things that would keep them away from himself. And the, you know, and the fellowship of his people. And we know we need, we need fellowship of other people. You know, you feel like you said alone. You don't have a support system if we don't have others to connect with, especially when we do something wrong. When you do something wrong and you're isolated, you know, I, I think of it as like a, a herd, you know, um, say a herd of, um, there's these animals in Africa that look like buffaloes, right? And then the lions try to get one, but he gets the weakest one. He gets the slowest one. So he isolates that one and then he devours that one. And it's the same thing. We, we need, um, the Bible says, do not forsake the gathering of brethren. We need each other to encourage each other, to build us up. Um, so God, you know, God was teaching mankind, you know, still about, relationship with him reconciliation with him about what keeps us may keep us away from him and at the same time god was teaching about redemption by killing off animals for the sins of man again we know part of his long-range plan there were rules to follow but what was equally or more important was the purpose behind the rules you know the word being taught about god himself you know, there's a scripture that says, you, you search a scripture seeking eternal life, but they all lead to me, which is Jesus. So our, our scripture reading for today, we'll go to that next, is Matthew 15, 1 through 20. Does anyone have their Bible? I'm going to split it up. If, so, if two people have their Bible, if one could read 1 through 10 and the other 10 through 20, or if we don't have two, just one person can read it. Anybody, any volunteers to read? If not, I will go ahead and read um, or give you some time. Anyone want, just needing time to look it up? Okay, Matthew 15, 1 through, if you read 1 through 10, and then we'll have someone do 11 through 20. Uh, I don't have my glasses, but I'm going anyhow. <laughs> Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Jesus replied, and why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you, but you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is devoted to God. They are not to honor their father or mother with it. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. 
Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. Then the disciples came to him and asked, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? He replied, every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them. They are blind guides. Leave them. They are blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. Peter said, explain the parable to us. Are you still so dull? Any of um, what verse is that? That was um, first 16 you started to read. You can continue 16. through 20. Are you, are you still so dull, Jesus asks them? Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of, the, of, out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defiles a person, but eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. So I'm just going to read um, the scripture, which is part of what the Pharisees were referring to, you know, um, they were focused on the, the law, which had been given in the time of Moses. And I'm just going to read a little bit of that law. And he says in Leviticus 11, now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying to them, speak to the children of Israel saying, these are the animals which you may eat among all the animals that are on the earth. Among the animals, whatever divides the hoof, having cloven hooves and chewing the cud, that you may eat. Nevertheless, these you shall not eat among those that chew the cud or those that have cloven hooves. The camel, which it, because it chews the cud, but does not have cloven hooves, is unclean to you. He names the rock hyrax, because it chews the cud, but does not have cloven hooves, it is unclean to you. The hare, because it chews the cud, but does not have cloven hooves, is unclean to you. You know, there, the swine, though it divides the hoof, having cloven hooves, yet does not chew the cud, it is unclean to you. Their flesh you shall not eat, and their carcasses you shall not touch. They are unclean to you. So the Pharisees were focused on, you know, the law from the time of Moses that says there are certain foods that they could not eat. And if they had eaten them, they would be unclean. But again, it goes back to what I was saying before, whereby God was teaching, you know, teaching people how to be holy. He had chosen the children of Israel um, as the group he would, you know, call his own people, not just to save them, but to save, you know, the entire world. He was showing these people how to be holy. And he, we know later on, sent them out because of their disobedience, exiled them to other lands, pagan nations, but through them continuing in the practices of God, the people are still observing and being able to come to know God, you know, come to know God through the, the people of Israel. But the point of God's teachings, you know, were again behind it to teach about himself, to teach, you know, ab about staying away from unclean things. But again, these, now we have better promises. He started the process of teaching us as mankind, you know, how to keep ourselves holy, how to stay away from certain behaviors and certain things. But the whole point of it was not to stay there, but to understand, you know, what the message was that Jesus was relaying through these ordinances about himself and about, you know, reconciliation with God. Anybody want to share any comments they have about the scripture and about um, just how it connects with, you know, the law, what Jesus was trying to say to the Pharisees or his disciples? Any comments? Okay. All right. Um, I just want to read a scripture that connects with that 
that um, scripture that we had, Matthew 15, you know, when Jesus spoke to the Pharisees, because he knew their heart, hearts, he said, woe to you in Matthew 23, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full, full of dead men's bones and uncleanness. You know, Jesus was very direct. And I just wanted to take a look at um, just what a whitewashed tomb looks like. Let's see, I'm going to share the screen for a second. So if you've you know, been to Greece or Spain, you see these whitewashed homes, right? Can you now, can can you see them? Yes, Lisa. Okay. So they look very beautiful, you know, very beautiful. They look clean, you know, but who knows what's going inside of each of those homes, right? We have no idea what's going on in any of those. And, and sometimes as people, that's just how we are as well. I can see you know, the Pharisee in myself, we see the Pharisee in today's time, right? It looks good from the outside, but we don't know what's going on, you know, inside the mind, what's going on inside the heart. How, how are we interacting and, and peop with people and perceiving, you know, God's people? So just to, I wanted to bring it to today's, um, you know, in kind of more connected to what we may see today. I'm going to just stop sharing for a second. Okay. Have you heard the term? If, um, just if someone mute, if you're in the kitchen or moving about, and you can unmute when you're ready to speak. Have you heard the, the term? Anyone heard the, the term unconscious bias? Yes. Okay. All right. How, how do you define that unconscious bias? Oh, well, I guess in my own interpretation, okay. yeah. it's, it's kind of like it's innate at a, at, at a point or you're, you're, you're swayed one particular way, mm -hmm. whether by how oh, you were cultured, just you know, workings of your mind, and it's not even something that you try to do. It's just kind of like your default then, or what you, you, you'd say is your default. But, um, you know, for example, um, the easiest way I can put it in is, I, I don't know John Brown, mm -hmm. but I know Mary Jane. And there's an issue that occurred. I wasn't there. But because I believe I know Mary Jane and I don't know John Brown, I'm swayed to be inclined more to believe Mary Jane just because she and I have some level of intimacy or some relations that I would say, okay, yeah. Um, no, so automatically I label John Brown the liar or the, the, the problem in the situation. And it's not that I sat with it and I assessed it and then I came up with that. It's just like the default setting is like, I don't know, you want to hear so you were wrong. I don't know if that makes sense, but it does. It does. That's, that's so, you know, it's just un like I'm just doing it because of what I perceive I know about a situation. Yes. Yeah, I think that's that's exactly it. You know, you may have an uh, Im implicit bias, you know, or prejudice or, you know, it can be a judgment in, in favor or even against, you know, a thing or a person or a or group um, of people. Um, do you think, you know, you know, what are some examples? Do you have, if you can think of some specific examples, you know, of um, unconscious bias that you may see, I'll start out, you know, sometimes um, people may treat people with money, you know, people who are rich better than others um, or treating people differently based on their looks, you know, what you perceive as beautiful or ugly or attractive, you know, or not. Um, any other examples that you can think of? Um. 
one came to my mind, which is, thank you, Jess, which is a little funny uh, that it came to my mind. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking about uh, our cultural, for those who are Caribbean or for those who are Jamaica, um, just our cultural um, biases when it comes down to political parties. Like, for instance, like you grew up in a, a let's let's, for example, say you grew up, be your parents are are JLPs. So you grew up and you grew up in that culture. You don't know the individual ministers. You don't know the individual leaders of your constitution, but that's what you grew up knowing. So automatically when you grow up, you're automatically a JLP, not even taking into question that, hey, let me see what they have to offer my community. Let me see what changes they're making. You just automatically, that's what you grew up in, automatically that's what you are and you just continue living that life not even taking the time out especially and not, and not to say that people tend to make that decision when they're not as educated but usually they just continue that trend from generation to generation so you're keep passing on those things so that's what came to my mind when I thought of that word that's a great example that's a great example and go ahead Shanika did you want to say something else Oh, yes. I totally agree with her. It's something that I, I laugh about a lot, that particular example. I find it so weird. Um, but um, there is one that the Lord really had to caution me about a lot. You know, in, in culture, I've always said I don't like, and I, again, I realize the spirit behind that. Um, you know, when you have been through abuse and trauma, you would oddly draw to it it's so weird but i have always been like i don't like soft men mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i perceive them to be too feminine and then there's a red flag that goes up in my mind like you know and i'm just being honest here i'm like are they even like straight or because this is too weird. Like, they're so softy, softy. And again, I recognize now the spirit that was operating in me behind that, why I was perceiving that way. And I remember when I came to the Lord, and when a man is truly surrendered to God, he's such a gentleman. He's so tender and he's so, he's, he's so soft, you know? And I remember I was going to church one morning and I saw a man, it was a Sunday morning, you know, dress and you know, on a Sunday you see a man decked in his suit, your mind automatically just assume that man's going to church. And he just had such a meekness to him that I I started to form a judgment about this man's sexuality unconsciously because that's how I perceived men who look soft to not be you know straight men. And the Lord really had to correct me in that moment and said, Janika, men, men that are truly submitted to me are not aggressive men. They are not inserting their masculinity where it's not needed. They don't walk around with the edge and the, hmm, and the like, yes, to them fierce. And yeah, I wonder, like, what could be the problem at 7 o'clock in the morning, sir? Like, what well, you feel like this? They are not like that. And the Lord really had to like, he could get me. And he just kind of showed me my past at the same time. And I've never seen that man grimace looking. Or I've never seen that man, you know, look like, look like P5. I'm like, and I was like, oh my gosh. And I realized that in my life, I have been so wrong. And I've been in my mind labeling me just because they don't look like what I have been taught to think a man should look or what the enemy has lied to me to believe that what that's what masculinity is and i was there and i said god this truly takes a renewing of the mind so that's one of the things i realized that sometimes we can see people but because we don't think they look like what they are supposed to look like we automatically make a judgment about them and we put them in a category because back then that person couldn't I've come to me to try to witness to me. Because in my brain, I'm like, you're a whole homosexual, sir. Where you gonna come to me about God? And I don't know this man, but just because he speaks eloquent, just because he pronounces his T's and he isn't rough and you know he's soft and he's gentle, I would have to, and I, I was there and I was like, oh my 
gosh. Mm. That was one that hit me really, really hard. Mm. And I didn't know that I was unconsciously labeling these people until the Lord really like turned the light on me. I was like, no, baby girl, that's not it. That's not it. I think that's a, a, a great one. And I'm, I, I applaud your Please. honesty, Tanika. Go, go ahead. Go ahead, Tass. Go ahead. Uh, I, I need to share one because I'm in my house and I'm just... I think if I don't stop laughing, if I don't share it, I'm not going to stop laughing. Um, an unconscious bias is, you know, men think that their mother's cooking is the best. You know, like, like I, I, I don't know. You know, like, you feel like, uh, I could uh, men feel like their mother, mm -hmm. their mother's, whatever their mother do, mm -hmm. like, that's the way it should be. Mm -hmm. Like, sometimes, even, even, you know, like when you're married, you probably still do the same thing. You know, my mother don't do it like that, so it, it's wrong. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I'm just thinking about that. I'm just thinking about that. Like, you know, for my family, we are so like that. We, you know, whatever way our mother do it, we feel like that's how it should be done. If you get what I mean, so that's 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 the unconscious bias. That's, that's you know, I'm here laughing about it to be quite honest. That, that's a great one. And it's it's very true, right? I mean, there's so many ways we can see it come out, right? We favor, in that case, you, you favor, you know, uh, someone who sim shares is similar, right? You favor your mother, or mother's cooking over others. And we do it with favoring people who share similar interests or backgrounds and experiences. And sometimes we can put people in boxes who are not similar or you may see even in some negative ways you may see someone who um and i'm gonna stop because i think shanika is unmuted are you did you want to share something else shanika no i not like that I, i'm sorry i was just gonna tell um brother george that it's not just with men because mm -hmm. i have to raise my hand to say that's not a man thing bro that's that's like uh, because for me especially in cooking like you can't tell me nothing. I know that my mother teach me. That's not what my mother do. Mm -mm. So I was just laughing here, saying that's not a man thing. It's like, nope. But you know, that speaks to thank you for sharing that, Shanika. And the, okay, you know, it, it speaks to just a mindset that we can develop, right? A mindset that we can develop where, you know, what we learn, what we understand, what we know is in the right. And there are other things that may be outside of that. What we experience may be in the right and someone who has a different experience may be in the wrong. And I'm just connecting that with even how the, the, the Pharisees, you know, kind of the way that they, though the Pharisees, and just a reminder that the Pharisees are the people who knew the word of God. They studied the word of God. You know, um, Paul was a Pharisee, Paul who, wrote most of the New Testament was a Pharisee. So he knew the word of God, but what was missing was, you know, the heart behind it, be seeing beyond themselves and really looking at the heart of God, which is, you know, God is for everyone, whether you're, you're like this one or like that one, you know, God came for everyone and so when we have that kind of unconscious bias some of the some of it is not that deep it can be just as you know simple and funny as as Taz sharing with you know his mom's cooking um but sometimes we may look at people right and um make assumptions oh you know people who commit crimes they're no good they're lazy they're uneducated some examples of things that people may say people make assumptions or people from certain areas they did it even in jesus time when they said no good thing comes from the town where jesus was from you know assumptions of people from different neighborhoods or backgrounds or certain families about certain you know they say the races um people in a lower status you know those we think with different morals than we have maybe we might think we are better than they are you might see a drug addict and again have a create this whole story of what this person may be like when we have not gotten the time, you know, taken the time to get to know the individual. You know, so when, again, we may see ourselves as 
Christians, you know, God fearing people, and we're doing this, we are doing this the right way, but we see someone clearly doing something that is wrong that we wouldn't do. And we may label and, and judge. Meanwhile, there is still stuff going on inside of us that is unclean. You know, by the definition they have before, that is unclean. That would seem, you know, to defile us. That would separate us from where God wants us to be. Um, so I just wanted to kind of bring it related to kind of an everyday term, you know, because it's so easy to kind of see the Pharisees and, you know, oh, you know, yeah, you, I think it was a Pharisee or a Sadducee who was saying, oh, when he prays, you know, he does this and that. Meanwhile, the person who the tax collector really was humble and saw himself for what he was, you know, a sinner. And, and that's who we are. We are, we are sinners, but we, are, we all fall short of the glory of God. All need his mercy, you know, all need this work that Christ did of, of reconciliation, you know, for us to be made pure again and, and be made right with God. Anika, you wanted to say something? Just to kind of agree, well, not kind of, wholeheartedly agree with everything you're saying. You know, it's one of the things that I always say to persons. I don't claim to be anywhere in Christ. Like, you know, I don't try to be like, oh, yes, I'm here. And I'm like, it's actually the opposite for me. You know, persons, I would talk to them and they would be like, you know, you're really you know, you really have the ability to grow in God and be powerful. And like when they're saying it, I don't try to shun them. But in my brain, I'm like, um, I don't ever want to feel like this power, like for me personally, I don't, you know, it's not for me to speak on what another person wants to believe. But for me, like, I don't ever want to see myself as, oh, you're a great, like, no, I just, me just want to be, uh, like I don't ever want to feel like I'm that high up or it's just not that for me and you know sometimes when they say I'm like can you not say that because it just I don't ever want to get my mind to that place where I feel like I am evil able to compete on any form of level and I don't know if that is humility or that's just me not walking in the confidence of God and I pray that he you know works on that with me but but right now where I'm at it's just like I don't, I don't know I'm not gonna. Oh, you know, people see me and a woman of God, and this and that. I'm like, um, it's not that deep. It's not that serious for me. But one of the things I always tell persons is, I don't know much, but the little that I know, I will share. Which, which is just me kind of saying, I don't have it all together. Like I'm a whole mess over here. Like this is the don't. Not because I tell you that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Like, don't make that make you feel like, oh, she knows scripture, man. She must like this and that. I know that one verse day. That's that one verse day. I know nothing, don't. And I feel like when you take on the, pers the perspective, like, okay, I know this doctrine and I know this, it kind of skew your mental thinking into thinking, okay, well, I know all this, so I must be somewhere up in God and I, it gives me the credibility to make certain claims or to see myself as a certain way when really and truly, you know, it's a, it's a sanctification process that takes place every single day. And it was a kind of a debate that a few of us had the other day when they were asking me if I believe that I am saved. And I said, I believe I was given entrance into salvation. But for me to sit here and say, I am saved and I'm, I'm like, I'm not going to say that. If that's what you want to say, that's fine. But I'm not saying that. Why am I not going to say that? Because if I get to just be baptized and I'm saved and that's it, then there would not be a need to die daily. I'm already saved. Like, why do I don't need to do all of this. I'm saved. I'm good. But I feel like when you understand that you've been given entrance into salvation. I've been given access to salvation. It's up to me now to walk this thing out. It's up to me to live every single day accepting and appreciating that I've been given access to salvation. Then that's when I believe you understand. You don't take it for granted. But if I get up every day and I'm like, I'm saved, then everything that I do, I feel like it's covered up under the fact that I'm saved. But when I look at it, and this is just how my brain works, when I look at it like Shanika, 
you've been given access to salvation water baptism and taking on the name of christ but if you don't walk this thing out every single day then that was all for naught that not gonna do nothing so you know it it it, it, it for me is kind of like the mind all oh, the, the scribes and the pharisees saw themselves like i'm i've studied this and i've studied that and i know this and i know that so i must be where really and truly i'm not Mm. So you don't, you're not willing to do the work to really look in yourself and say, hey, you know, you know, you know, because you think that you are somewhere where you really are not, and that's because you take on this mindset that, oh, I have God, I'm good, I'm, I'm saved. You, like, you, you, there's nothing more needed for me to do. I but when I look at it from the perspective, like I've only been given entrance and access to salvation, this is something that I'm gonna have to work to keep every single day. All right. Well, Sir Shanika, I think that opens up another discussion. Access to salvation, die daily. I, I think it, 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 Taz and I actually had a conversation similar, you know, but I know it would be good for us to say what the scripture says. I think what you're saying is right, but I, I think the Bible also defines salvation. Yet, yes, we should still humble ourselves under the hand of the Almighty, right? And he says he's there's a process he's purifying us we are we like a spiritual house are being built so the work has been done once and for all he says but we are still being built and he who begun a good work in us will continue it until the day of salvation thankfully so i think your you what you're saying is saying that i am saying yes to the work that god is going to continue to do until the day that jesus christ returns um but i know others may have a, def not a definition to say okay i'm saved because the bible says if i believe in my heart and confess with my mouth that jesus christ is lord and that he was resurrected that i am saved um but i do understand you know what you're saying as well that you continue to you know um take up your cross daily right and follow me because the process continues until jesus returns Anybody else wanted to say something? Share anything? I, I want to share Lisa quickly. Um, as you said, I think that one is a that one is definitely a separate discussion. Mm -hmm. To be quite honest, because um uh personally, I don't feel one saved, always saved. I okay. think um it's a it's a daily battle. Because if that was the case, and once you save, always save, there wouldn't be any need to continue doing the things you have to do. And one of the reasons I say that, as we said in scripture, you know, when the Lord said, um, depart from me, you know, I, you know me not, if you get what I mean. Those people... Um, said i think i think i think it said oh did i not prophesy in your name did i not heal in your name did i not do all this in your name so that person would have assumed that they were they were saved but truly i mean they didn't know god if you get what i mean they didn't know god so i, I my personal view and i think we're drifting from the point what we're doing today but my personal view is we should never think that we are there. The day we think we are there, that is the road to, you know, down downhill. If you get what I mean. So, I mean, yeah, we're, we're drifting a little bit, but I just I just needed to say that a little bit for myself. Okay, all right, thank you, Taz. So we're gonna reel it back into, you know, we're talking about um the being unclean and the defilement and I do think that's a good topic and we will definitely I think we should have a session dedicated to it one study um, fully that we can hear all of the different perspectives on it and discuss it but you know going back to our study today you know just about um, what was considered unclean how people felt when they were you know removed from the assembly of God how people felt in that time even when you know the Pharisees they were uh, self-righteous you know they really didn't um the heart wasn't changed god it, it was still about even though you had the rules of god the the laws the ordinances that needed to be followed you know everything god does again is about love 
And so the transformation had not yet happened in their hearts, you know, to be able to see what he was trying to say behind everything. So Isaiah 64 verse six says, but we are all like an unclean thing and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. And in Luke chapter 11, 39 through 41, he says, Jesus says to the Pharisees, now then you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and, and, and the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You foolish people did not the one who made the outside make the inside also. But now as for what is inside you, be generous to the poor and everything will be clean for you. So God is more interested in our inner man, our heart, you know, not what people can see, um, but what they don't see. You know, it's similar to when David went to go um, anoint the next king of Israel after Saul. You know, he just went and chose the one that he thought made sense. Um, so, you know, we can look righteous, but they're still, and everyone, doesn't matter, everyone, like you said, connected to what you and Shanika were saying, there is still a work being done. There's still a transformation process that's happening. And it's it's happening from the beginning when we said, yes, Jesus, to the day when, you know, we die. It, it continues. No one will have arrived, no matter how long we've been walking with the Lord. So I love what Psalm 51 verse two says. It says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Purge me with hyssop, hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. So as we said, you know, before the practices um, in the Old Testament, the two things were happening. The, um, the shedding of blood for our sins and the purifying, purifying us to to make us holy, you know, and acceptable to God. And Jesus, again, in himself, came with both the blood and the water to be able to accomplish both. Now, I'd ask you before to consider, like, you know, the woman at the well, for example. And in John 4, um, verse 7 says, a woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink of me, a Samaritan woman? for Jews have no dealings with Samaritan, Samaritans. And this is when Jesus said to her, you have had five husbands and the one whom you now have is not your own husband in that you truly speak. You know, he, again, based on the laws of, the, of Moses, the laws of the Old Testament, you know, which they were still following these laws when, when Jesus walked the earth, this woman was labeled as unclean, you know, she was labeled as def defiled. But Jesus answered her when, he, when she saying to him, you know, if you, you knew that I know that I'm a Samaritan, we have no dealings with Jews. But Jesus answered and said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. You know, so what she, the, the position she was in before, she was defiled, you know, she should not, she shouldn't be talking to um, this man. She, she is ostracized probably from her community. People talk about her, you know, they know what's going on in her life. But Jesus is saying to her that um, you would have asked me, if you understood what I could give to you, you would have asked me instead of me asking you, you know, for water. So we no longer we are in this position today where we no longer defile the tabernacle of the Lord. You know, he He knows what we're about. He knows everything about us. Because remember in that same scripture, she, you know, she goes to the people of her town and say, come see a man who told me everything about myself. He's this prophet. So he sees the things that we have even said to other people, you know, the things inside that we might not we might be embarrassed or ashamed to share that we have done, but he's saying that even with knowing these things, he's telling us, come and I would give you this gift, you know, this, I would give you the drink of living water. And we talked about water before two weeks ago, what water does, water washes away things, it, it makes it clean, you know, so many other different um, things that water does, water purifies that we, we look at that, look at the list that we shared two weeks ago, but you know, he welcomes us, he welcomes, he, the, the Bible uses these examples of these people 
that again, you know, would be ostracized, but he's saying he welcomes our unclean touch so that we can be made whole and be made clean because on our own, no matter what we would do, you know, our own righteousness is as filthy rags. So he's saying that come to him so that he can do the washing, so that he can do the cleansing, so that he can justify us. You know, as we know the word justify, just as if we never did anything wrong. That was the purpose, that was the process before of making the people clean. And that is still his process today of making us clean. First Corinthians 6 verse 11 says, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. So Jesus stretches out, you know, he's reaching to this woman to draw her close to himself so that he can cleanse. And even with the leprous man, you know, when he went to heal him, he stretches out his hand to the leprous man. That's, you know, when you think of it, for going back to the time of the Old Testament, you know, it's almost as if it seems like God is turning away from that leprous person. But again, I said he he wasn't, you know, even though he said they had to leave and they were unclean for a certain, they had to leave for a certain period. It was just because he didn't want them to die in their uncleanness when they approached him. But now he's given us a better, you know, better promise, you know, re a reconciliation process now that has the Lord Jesus in the flesh walking the earth and what he did when he walked the earth. And it's, we're still living in that today. So now he can reach out to the leprous man. Now he can reach out to the adulterous woman um, and, you know, he, he reached out to the adulterous woman and he told her, go and sin no more. And he can reach out to the harlot who washed his feet with, with her tears because we're now again on a, a different dispensation. Now he's reconciling us. Now he's saying that you don't have to deal with your uncleanness through these processes anymore. I am the living water that makes you clean. You know, I am the one who wants you to be close to me. I just wanted to read the scripture, the small scripture about the harlot in Luke's chapter seven, verse 39, when the Pharisee who had invited Jesus, you know, when he saw what the woman was doing, you know, he spoke to himself saying, this man, if he were a prophet would know who and what manner of woman this is, who is touching him for she's a sinner. You know, if, if he's saying, you know, if he really knew, but the thing is, isn't it wonderful that Jesus really knows, you know, he really knows what's going on inside of us. He really knows the thoughts that we don't share with someone else, you know, when we're doing things or when we're even processing what other people are doing and maybe judging you know, that unconscious bias. You know, he knows. And it's like the more we walk with him, the more he reveals those things, for example, the way we're perceiving others in a way that he shows us our own shortcomings. You know, when we look at others and want to see what this person has done or, oh my gosh, this person is so wicked or whatever it is, he shows us ourselves, but he, he doesn't want us to turn away when he shows us ourselves. He wants, he wants to remind us as he did through with the leprous man, with the adulterous woman, you know, with the harlot that I want you to come close to me, even with your uncleanness, even with how we've been defiled. I want you to come close to me. And he stretches his help, hand out to the leprous man in Luke 5, verse 13, which people didn't want to touch the leprous man before because they would become, you know, unclean. So in these miracles, Jesus proved his power over all that makes us unclean. You know, his purity is greater than our impurity. You know, again, his purity is greater than our impurity. And I think uh, before, let me just say stuff with what I think. Anybody want to say anything based on those scriptures? Well, for me, I think that one of the beautiful things that I love about even the scriptures that you read is, as you said, you know, God always looks at the heart. And we always have a choice in life. And some of our decisions are really circumstance-based. You know, like, a lot of us hurt. You know, the victim now becomes the perpetrator kind of thing. It's kind of like this weird way in which 
our minds sometimes to process the things that happen to us. And in turn, we oddly sometimes we start to project that outward. You know, the, the, the Bible didn't tell us much about the woman that had the five husbands. But what would have been her circumstance? Why she would have ended up there? You know, sometimes I think we look at people and all we see is their sin and their shortcomings. But what, what happened? What would make this person who is fully aware that there is a God? You know, because she even said to him, the Messiah is coming. So she, even, even in her sin, she had hope in her heart that like, this, the, the must, I mean, just I wait for the Messiah to come. You know, and she, she was growing bitter because she's like, you people, it's like, you guys make it like hard for me to do anything about this. But I'm waiting on the Messiah. He's going to make all of this make sense. So though she is in sin, there was something still tender in her heart. Like she's like, I, I know, hope. She's holding on to something, you know. And that to me was so interesting. Again, the woman, you know, caught in the act of adultery. What, what, how was she there? Was it? Was she a willing participant? You understand? Like we don't know the circumstance. Why would God? I mean, there's so many speculations about what He wrote in the dirt. You know, when they started to use the law to condemn her, because by the law, the law standard, she would be condemned. But he wrote something, and so many people summarize what they think he wrote. Maybe they say, rewrite something. You know, I, I don't know. But we we don't, as you said, you know, we look at people outward and we see them and we judge them. But what was the circumstance that led to this person being in this position? What broke in this person that caused this to be an option that they considered? Mm. You know, and, and again, when you look at it that way, you see people not for what they have done. And I think that's that's the whole essence of what God wants us to do. Like, see them how I see them. I don't see you as a drug addict. I see you probably as a child trauma victim trying to cope. And in trying to cope, you have made so many mistakes along and you have contributed to your own hurt and your own demise. Yes, but there was something that happened to you. Something in your psyche, something in you broke that I want to fix, but you're, you're, you're so far gone that society just, you left them to them own demise, yeah, because them no one nothing good. But something happened to you, something happened to you. There's, there's no normal person that is going to sit and inject heroin in their veins. Like that's not a, a functional thing, like something happened. This person is either under the influence of serious, serious demonic forces or something broke in that person. So for me, again, you know, the, the, the persons that you spoke about, the woman with the issue of blood, you know, just going through things, just ostracized, just so much despair and anguish inside. And when you shun them, or you throw the word that they throw the, the book at them, or you throw the rules at them, like, what have you done to, to show them about me? What have you done to show them that I care? The Bible says that you should not sin. Okay. Why am I sinning? Do you know why I'm even in this position? You know, so I, I I agree wholeheartedly and I believe that's just how I, when I look at how God wants us to see other people and how God wants us to approach even being Christians. It's not like you're not a Christian because you go to church. You, you know, you're not a Christian because you know scriptures. You take on my name because you see people how I see them. And when you see them how I see them, there's no way you can treat them based on the law because if, if, if I'm seeing a traumatized 10 year old tra you know tra trapped in a, a an adult body I don't like I, in, in me like that's a break my heart like oh my god like you know like, like my there's no way Mega can come to you know approach y'all rough and you need to that, like I've seen like I'm like oh my god like we just want okay oh we just want like 
it's gonna like you know, we just want to rescue you. Like that's just oh my man, like come on, come. like I'm I want to rescue you. I want to go to war for you. Like listen, listen, man, listen. Like everything will come up against your dead, but kill everything because like I just want like, and I think that's how God sees us. Like I just want to protect you from everything, including your own mistakes. Mm-hmm. I might grumble, you know, and I don't mean to be long winded, but it's just, I'm it, I am so when I think of God and I think of His goodness and I think that's just how my mind computes it. Like He saw everything that I was gonna do. He knows the evil that I contemplate in my heart to do. He knows it, and He saw the cross and said. Yep, still worth it. Mm. Like that baffles my mind sometimes. Like, like I see, and it, and I always tell people, how does salvation not break them? It breaks me down to a point. I cry because I'm like, you knew that I would do that. You knew that I would do that, and you said, I will still die for you. Like my brain, I'm like, God, I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't get it. My brain can't wrap this. Like, I'm like, and that's I know when I sin, like it hurts me because I'm like, God. It's like a slap in your face. Like, I am sorry. Because you saw me, the tragedy that I would be, and you were like, Yep, she's still mine. That blows my mind. Blows my mind, man. Mine too. Thank you, Shanika. Amazing. Any anybody else want to say anything? Um, I wanted to say something, and also thanks to Shanika for that, because that's that that you just said is definitely like where I stand to. You just, I don't know, like just thank you. <laughs> you you definitely touched some points there that I also resonate with. Um, just on my walk with God and just on my journey to to the promised land. Um, but I kind of wanted to touch a little bit on, I think a little bit of what Shanika said, and also just the concept of the woman with the issue of blood to tie it back to the topic of today. Um, for, and the topic of today is of being defiled. But when, you th- when I think about the woman with the issue of blood, you can see those adjectives that we, we spoke about uh, manifesting in her. And also as it relates to the statement that said that when women were are on their menstrual or they are seeing blood or blood comes forth from them, that no one is supposed to touch them because if they do touch them, they also become defiled. And just to see that, she, I, I'm, I'm assuming here that she knew that that was the case. So I'm assuming that if she had seen Jesus or had access to go to Jesus for him to touch her, she would not have thought that she was worthy. And so why for her, it was important for her to then access faith. And a lot of times as, as Christians, as, as believers, we, as, we it, it, I feel like that's the reason why we got to a point where, where Jesus came and said, hey, or it, it was made known that your works alone is not enough. The law alone is not enough. The law would lead you to focusing on self, to think that I did it, or I am the man, or 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 I did all this all by myself, and there's no reason or any need for God. And and so why we have to truly serve God through faith, because it's by her faith, by her faith going forth and deciding that hey. I don't think I'm worthy in this moment for 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 Jesus to touch me. So I'm believing that if I only touch his garment, she didn't say if I only touch his foot, if I only touch his hand, if I only touch his hair. She didn't think she was worthy enough to touch his body. So she said, I'm just going to touch his garment. That's how far off she is. And sometimes the enemy will tell you that, hey, you're not worthy of forgiveness. You are too defiled for a prophet, for a man of God to see you and 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 through God change your life. So sometimes when you are defiled, it can pull you so far. It can put you in a place of isolation where you don't think you're worthy, but her faith brought her the healing. Her faith made her to be undefiled. 
And that's one of the things about when you feel undefiled, that your faith can change your story, your faith. And that's the reason why you, you can do as much work as you want to do, but without faith or faith without work is dead. Same way work without faith is dead. You can do as much. That's why you see a lot of wealthy men, wealthy women out there that they do all these great things. But by the time they get to their old age, there's no joy. There's no happiness. There's nothing in there to keep them. They look back and they see a bunch of zeros in their, in their accounts, but no fulfillment in all the things that they've done and accomplished. So we have to surrender or I know I'm saying like a, a few different points in here, but we have to surrender our own will, our own self-will to the will of God. We have to trust him and we have to walk by faith, not by sight. Because had that woman with the issue of blood not operated in the place of faith, she would probably still until this moment buried and dead, seeing blood. <laughs> right? Amen. So I just wanted to touch on that point. And I, and I love that you did. I love everything that's been shared today. Um, I just wanted to share this part of the scripture about the woman with the issue of blood. You know, when when Jesus said, you know, who touched me? Because um, he said, somebody touched me for I perceive power going out from me. Now, when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared to him in the presence of all the people, the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. So, you know, she put aside, lay aside the shame of this situation. And sometimes it's like lay aside the, the shame of, of, of whatever, it, you know, is attached to that, that negative feeling, that, that feeling of defilement and go to him. Cause he says, you know, if we confess he is faithful and he's just, you know, so she said it in front of all these people. This was my problem, but God used it. This, you know, use it to glorify himself, right? That you can come to me with uncleanness, even for 12 years of uncleanness. That's a long time. And I will make you clean and I will make you whole. And you're right, Janelle. He said that he said to her daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. You know, he gives that credit back to her for her part in it. Your faith, you know, has made you well. And that's what the Bible says, Acts 15, verse 9. He says, having now been cleansed by faith. If we believe that Jesus is really doing this, he's purifying us by what he did on the cross. This is what we have access to. Then our faith by whatever we have done, our faith to believe that that work was really done on the cross, that Jesus came with blood and came with water, then we are cleansed by faith. Then we are forgiven by faith in the work that we, he has done. He says, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. So we no longer need to worry about ceremonial, you know, cleanness and ceremonial uncleanness because it was all done in what Jesus did. Go ahead, Shanika, I think that is. Yes, you know, for in my own experience, and you know, Janelle, um, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. She said something that really resonated with me. You know, the woman with the issue of blood, you know, it wasn't by her works that caused her, for what we know, to be in the situation that she was in. But, you know, let's say you were defiled by your own actions, you know, which most times, you know, sometimes is the case, not most, but sometimes is the case. You know, as you said, sometimes when you accept, like you you, you condemn your own self, then like you feel, you feel so far gone because you you know the word of God, you know you're not supposed to be sinning, right? And then when you do, it's like this condemnation comes over you. And I remember the Lord let me, so first John 3 verse 20. And you know, you have to remind me of it the other day again, where he says, for if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. And I remember when I just came to Christ and reliving, you know, all my past mistakes and everything. And I remember, like, I struggled with the acceptance that I was forgiven for a very, very long time. I didn't believe that I was, I could ever be saved, baptized, but I just, I didn't feel like I was saved because I was going through such a hard, you know, health issue and I felt like well if I'm saved then I'm healed 
because that's what it looks like on TV. Like, you know, the person baptized and the next man in them wake up and their whole life just fall into place. And it wasn't looking like that for me. So I would cry and I would ask God, you know, why am I a castaway? I've cried and I've asked you to forgive on me and you're not healing me and I feel like a castaway and I would cry like just despair, just utter despair. And I remember, I don't know how I found that scripture. I want to say the Holy Spirit led me to because I didn't know the Bible much. So I wasn't, it was like, I, it just, I just saw it. It says, if your heart condemns you, know that I am great. And I took that and it has helped me so much like to know that, listen, and you know, it's what was being reiterated in, in the whole lesson today. Like God is, is, is faithful to forgive you. But I believe that he, he places his word in different areas in the Bible. He reiterates his points in different areas in the Bible and through different scriptures, but essentially saying the same thing. And for me, it was that, that's the one that did it for me. You know, if your heart condemn you because there's so many times, and you, it's not that you don't want to believe because you just don't want to believe in God. It's that there's just so much sorrow in your heart that you're like, how can God forgive a person like me like what what we like what what good would i have to offer him and that scripture man i'm telling you it really reshaped how i looked at like even god i had to be like god then you're telling me that you know because the concept at the time of like god being greater than my heart my brain didn't connect the two like there was a disconnect and god is saying this if your heart condemn you I am bigger than don't 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 even make your own heart tell us say you're not mine. Don't make your heart, don't make for your second, not even your heart. You believe so deep in your heart. Don't let not even that stop you from believing what I say. Cause I am greater than that. And that was the one that I'm like, whoa, man, God, Jesus. You know, it, it just bring it back to evil, the, 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 the tax collector. Like, that's the prayer you pray. Like, God, I'm a sinner. I don't have no right nor reason to even be here saying your name. But for some reason, some reason beyond when my small look in the brain can't comprehend, you see me more than this. And that's what, you know, I believe you, you share with somebody that you see they're struggling with self-condemnation. Like, God, man, God, bigger than your heart. And that for me, and I, and I even said it to my mother. I said, you know what I realized about God? You know, sometimes they, they tell you, God knows everything. And, you know, it's when you kind of start, get it for yourself. You start really understand. And I said, God is so good. God knows everything where you're going to go through. It's like it, it just something just in there for everything. I'm like, oh, if they know, say, me, I'm gonna need this, like, like this, like, just they know, like, you say, you know, and sometimes you're like, me, I forget to, I got, can I say, kind of, oh, yeah, they know, I'm gonna need that. And then we have a laugh and say, okay, I got those it. But come here, say, me, I get it. And guys, again, you know, hearing me talk, sometimes I sound like a ramble, but it's just so much that's in me, so much in my heart, so much in my mind. Like, I'm like, God, it's like my brain, like I play a catch up because I'm like, this man is blowing my mind at every corner, man. Sometimes I have to say, God, wall up like a bit, man. Let me catch my breath because it's like it's so mind blowing. It's like, I'm like everything I thought I knew was a lie. I'm like, whoa. You know, so that, that scripture for me, I believe, you know, the, again, bringing it back to the topic of undefiled and feeling, all of those feelings, like it's free your heart, man, because God bigger than it. Amen. You know, so that's just what I wanted to share. Sorry for rambling. Thank you for sharing. And you're not rambling. And just a reminder, not everyone is from Jamaica. I hope you understood everything, Marianne, um, because she really shared some great things there. Um, any other comments? We're just going to wrap up with a few scriptures that align with our topic and, and just bringing back the list of what we said water does, like again, connecting it, you know, with Jesus, because he is the living water. Any other comments before we do that? Um, I just wanted to say this one thing. I remember having a conversation with sister, with Reverend Carrie Ann. Um, she's not here today, but um, one of the things that 
even helped me on my journey as a as a Christian or just as a believer um, is just remembering that faith is the currency of heaven. And um, I just felt so led to share that with everybody, that faith is the currency of heaven. If you can operate, think, give, love in faith, you will, the presence of God will be with you and surround you and you will see doors open to you. You'll see his grace, his mercy, all those things come come to you and give you an unexpected end. But one of those things that has been just really a guiding force for me is that faith is the currency of heaven. The same way money is the currency of the world that gives you access to the everything, faith is that currency of heaven that gives you access to heaven. So I just wanted to share that. And thank you for sharing that, Janelle. Powerful reminder. Go ahead, Taz. And, um, you know, um, I just wanted to say this too, that uh, Paul prayed you know, three times for God to remove the thorn from his side. What the thorn was, we don't know. And I think the Bible specifically done that. So... It doesn't specify exact thing. We all have a thorn in our side, somewhere or the other. But what did he say to Paul? He said, my strength will be made perfect in your weakness. So I just want to say, you know, whatever thorn is in our side, same as Shanika said, you know, God is greater than our heart. You know, whatever it is, Whatever thorn we think, whatever struggle we think that we are going through, um, you know, he said he's overcome the world, isn't it? He said there's no sin that is new. There's nothing new under the sun. So, you know, what, whatever thorn is in our side, whatever we feel, God is greater than that, as Shanika said. And I think, um, I mean, God, God always find a way to give everyone what they need. If you get what I mean, and um, you know, God is greater than all our problems, all our trials, you know, all whatever we think, you know, whatever our mind can imagine, He is greater than it. There is nothing that He cannot do. There's nothing He cannot fix. There's nothing that He doesn't see. There's no heart He cannot mend. There's nothing that's dead that He can't bring alive. There's nothing that He can't restore. There is nothing that he cannot do. So we just need to continue to walk this, you know, this 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 walk of faith, you know, that we're doing, and just continue on the path because, as Janelle said, you know, I love this scripture that says, "I know the plans I have for you." You know, I don't say uh, uh, for an expected end. I leave the expected out. I say for a sure end. You know, that I know the plans we have. And, you know, no matter what, no matter what we think, no matter what we're going through, no matter how we think it's impossible, the Bible itself shows us that there is nothing that our God cannot do. There is nothing that he cannot do. And I, and I want to leave that with everyone today to say there's nothing that we cannot do. There's some thorns that's going to be in our side, but it's there to keep us humble. It's there to keep us on our knees with God. Because sometimes, you know, we feel like, okay, today is a good day. I have everything. Sometimes he leaves that thorn to prick you in your side for you to go to him. Because a broken and con contrite heart, he will not, you know, he will, he, he will always be there for us. So that's that's what I wanted to say today, to everyone. Thank you for saying that. That's, that's a great, great reminder, great encouragement, um, and an on-time word, you know, on-time word for us. Um, any other comments before? Anything else anyone wants to share again before I read the last few scriptures just as reminders for us? Okay. All right. Um, and in wrapping up, you know, our study on water again, I um, just want to read Isaiah 55, verse 1. He says, Come all 
you who are thirsty, come to the waters. Oh, no matter where we are in our walk with God, no matter who we are, no matter what we've done, it says, come all who are thirsty, come to the waters. John 7, 37, on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He has more than enough for us, more than enough for that covers everything that we, you know, may be dealing with or have to deal with in the future. John 4, verse 14, but whoever drinks the water I will give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a fount of water springing up to eternal life. John 7, verse 38. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. The Bible says we were dead in our trespasses and we are now made alive with Christ. We have a new life in Jesus and we know you know, water, if you you may have a plant that's dying, I am not the best with plants, but water can revive that plant. Like Taz remind us, you know, God is a restorer. So his water that we, we go to him, you know, he said, come all who are thirsty and he has more than enough. And his water is, it will spring up to eternal life. So if it's that eternal life, which is forever, you know, these things that we may go through, endure, experience, they are not forever, right? But he's given us this water that will refresh us forever, renew us forever. Um, some of the things we said, water, it transforms, you know, um, it can evaporate, you know, it's there because of, uh, you know, when you think of the cycle of rain coming down to the earth and going up in the clouds and there's rain in the, there's water rather in the air. So it's there even when we can't see it, you know, just like Jesus. Sometimes we can't see, can't feel, can't sense his presence, but nevertheless, it's a fact, you know, it's there. Um, it purifies, like we says, it's, it's essential for health. We know we, we started out the water discussion talking about the first lesson, how much of our body is made up of water, how much of the earth is made up of water, how much of our brain is made up of water. You know, it's essential. We need it. We can't do without it. Um, so it, it, we know it refreshes and all these wonderful things. So go back to the well, you know, go back to him each time we're feeling like we're in a dry place, each time, you know, when we're feeling, you know, whatever it is, despair, or if you feel like you have been ostracized, you know, like the people before, the emotions that we said, and I'm just going to go back and just read some of them, because I think they're just so powerful and they, they're relevant to what we feel when we're going through different things. There's fear of being alone, losing support system, shame, you know, unworthy, rejected, hopeless, anger, anguish. You know, many of these emotions we can connect to various situations, but he's saying again, come, come back to him. Water is multifaceted and water will do it, it, it just so many things that his water will do, the living water of Jesus will do. And um, that is the end of our study on water. We may pick it up again in some other way. Actually, we haven't done baptism. So I, I know it will come back again, you know, um, in another time, whenever, the, whenever God wants us to discuss it. But I just wanted to also share, I went to, I went to church the Sunday after we did the first discussion on water. And there was a preacher who came that was a guest preacher because it was a pastor's appreciation. And he had a word, of course, regular sermon, right? But beyond the regular sermon, there was a point in um, the service where it just got quiet. And then, you know, he knew someone was speaking in, in tongues. And, you know, you'll know the tongues of, of praise. And then, but there's one tongue where you know it's, it's a message from the Lord. And that's what happened there. The person, you know, got quiet. And then the Lord gave the pastor the revelation. And, you know, I, I personalized it. But he, what he was saying to the body was, you're getting ready to step into your tomorrow. Better is coming. He's getting ready to change your outward appearance. 
is getting ready to change your attitude about yourself and who you are in the kingdom of God. And I just wrote down, I was like, wow, God, you always connect things because, you know, as we say, water can transform. And that's the very thing that Jesus did as his first miracle when he changed, you know, the water into wine. He's, he's transforming us. He's continued to strengthen and build up these, these inner, the inner man. And I was telling Taz yesterday, one of my favorite scriptures is first Peter chapter two, verse five, where he's talking about, you know, we are being built. You know, that reminds me each time that it, it's a work that's happening every day, Lisa. So wherever my emotions may be or my situation may be today, it doesn't matter because the work continues and it may be a different thing. He may give me something different tomorrow, but he is transforming. He's aware of our situations. He's aware of the things, every part of us, everything that's going on in our lives. And he has a good plan. Amen. Thank you everyone for being on today. Um, and we thank God most of all for his word and his, his beautiful word and wonderful reminder um, to us of what he's doing in us and what he does for us. Um, praise God. Anyone, any volunteer to do our benediction today? Before I call on somebody. <laughs> any volunteers? All right, I'm going to ask Sister Jennifer if you're able to. Are you able to do the benediction? Yes, Sister Lisa. Thank you. Lord, um, we bless you. We thank you for this fellowship and, and, uh, and study of the word today. We pray that we will go in blessings and in peace. We pray that you will go with us. Keep us and, and be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And I, I realized that I didn't take prayer requests. And I'm just going to ask for us to just lift up each other in prayer even when we come off this platform. Thank you, Sister Jennifer, for the benediction. I did that only because the time has been far spent. But please remember to lift up each other in prayer. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, and lift up our communities and just encourage each other. If you are able to connect with each other offline, if we can encourage each other in, in the Lord. Thank you, everyone, for being on today. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Amen. Amen. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Enjoy. Thank you for having me. Bye. Bye.